In this part two video on the costumes of Essos, I explore the region of Slaver's Bay from the HBO series Game of Thrones. Coming up. Welcome back to another episode of Costume Co. Each week I analyze the costumes of some of your favorite shows and movies. If this is something that interests you, consider subscribing and hitting the bell notification icon so you don't miss anything. Part 2 and 3 are dedicated to the costumes of the slaver cities. So in this episode, we're looking at the costumes of Astapor. As I mentioned in my last video, Michelle Clapton has provided spotty detail about these costumes. So I've had to rely on Wikia for some information, along with my own observations, trying to get inside the mind of the costume designer. So this video has taken me longer than most because I am making new discoveries as I deep dive into every new region. So let me know your thoughts and impressions in the comments below. I always love hearing your ideas. And I also thought I'd mention that I'm going to try and do my first live stream over the holidays, perhaps in the new year. So I don't have any topics picked yet. So let me know in the comments below if you have any ideas. So before we get to the main content, I have another segment of Show Your Art that features submissions from my talented viewers. These are specifically Game of Thrones inspired. I've also set up a Facebook page featuring many of the submissions and I'll leave a link for that in the description below. First up, I have these artist sketches by Vitor Vitrenji. He did this set of Daenerys renderings for the Inktober challenge, which is a drawing challenge where artists draw something with ink, liners, or even just gel pens for every day of October. That's the name, Ink plus October equals Inktober. I'm blown away not only by Vitor's drawing skills, but also his ability to capture Danny's costumes with such accuracy. Next is a submission from cosplayer Maltese Lizzie McGee. She's done lots of Game of Thrones cosplay. This one is of Daenerys' marine gown. So she tells me she used a synthetic material for the blue dresses, but she said that it was much too thick and it made the smocking very difficult, saying, if I try this in the future, I'll be sure to use a thinner, natural material. Here are two more looks. So on the left is Danny's Astapor costume, which is, you know, a perfect fit for this video. And on the right, her Khaleesi costume, complete with the white horse. Finally, Maltese Lizzie McGee created this season six Sansa Stark dress from a stretch velvet that was the closest she could find, she tells me, saying it's more of a dark green than teal. And she hand embroidered the dire wolf detail. And I think the results look amazing. Next up, Tatiana Malenko shared with me some of her cosplay that she sells through her Etsy shop. And while she's a talented cosplayer and artist, she also happens to be the lead character artist for the Elder Scrolls Online. That's her day job. So she's someone who's famous in her field. I feel so happy that she watches this channel. And the outfit that she wears here is, of course, inspired by Cersei Lannister. Here are two items sold through her Etsy shop. First on the left is a custom-made Sansa Stark direwolf choker, and on the right is Queen Cersei's crown. Both of these items are 3D printed. Here are two more items from her shop. On the left is Marjorie's wedding crown, and on the right is Melisandre's octagonal necklace. Mel's necklace looks like an exact replica. Finally, Tatiana is also a very talented embroidery artist. Here are two examples of her work. On the left is Cersei's lion sigil, and on the right is her queen Cersei's embroidery with an embossed lion. This was on her blow up the Sept of Baylor dress, you might recall. And I'm hoping to get to talk to Tatiana more about the 3D process and hopefully she can find the time in her busy schedule for that so um, I can share that with you. And I have another sketch from Tatiana Melendez. She's already thinking ahead about season eight and created this endgame costume for Danny and John. 
should they both be left standing by the end of the series? On my new Facebook page, I've created a photo album of all of Tatiana's costumes that she submitted over the last year to me along with some other viewer submissions. So please check that out. I'll leave a link below. And thanks again to Veter, Maltese Lizzie McGee, Tatiana Malenko, and Tatiana Melendez for sharing your work with us. And if you want to share your art, I'll leave my email in the description below. Or if you prefer, you can also reach out to me on Twitter or Facebook. In this episode, I'm looking at the costumes in the area known as Slaver's Bay, later renamed Bay of Dragons by Daenerys Targaryen. So Slaver's Bay was once the heartland of the Giscari Empire. I'm speculating here, but from what I've read, this ancient group of peoples are possibly based upon the Egyptian and Phoenician civilizations, although there, are, there does appear to be some ancient Greek thrown in for good measure. Hey, and I'll probably get some of the pronunciations wrong, so just bear with me. Astapor, also known as the Red City, is the southernmost of the three great city-states of Slaver's Bay that breeds the Unsullied. The good masters seen here were the ruling elite of the city of Astapor. The good masters, including slave trader Krasnus Mo Naklaz, wears silk garments created in shades of bone, muted greens, yellows, and blues. There are some variations on the costumes, like these Moroccan-style fez headdresses with veils, worn on the male and female masters seen in the background. This style of hat is also known as a tarbouche. Here's a small sampling I wanted to show you of pure soft silk and also dupiani silk from uh, Desi Crafts. They carry apparel items, but also beautiful a beautiful variety of Indian silk. Krasnus's garment appears to have many influences, and I think that Michelle Clapton does a great job of marrying the looks and making it unique to the region. So this tunic looks similar to a Persian kaftan, or even a Norse or Saxon tunic, so they typically have gussets under the arms for ease of movement, and gores in the skirt for additional fullness. And I'll point out that in history of clothing, there's often crossovers across cultures because they oftentimes borrowed heavily from one another. So, you know, a prime example of this is how the Romans copied not only the clothing and architecture of the ancient of ancient Greece, but they also adopted their gods too. Pictured here is a medieval woolen tunic discovered with the remains of a man in a peat bog in Sweden. This reconstructed tunic, believed to be among the best preserved medieval tunics in Europe, is dated sometime between the 14th or 15th century. And like the Vikings, the tunic is cut as one piece, front and back, with separate sleeves, gores, and gussets. And you can learn more about Viking dress by checking out my visit to the Viking exhibit. Here is something close to the look of the Young Kai tunic. This 8th century kaftan is from the Caucasus region and it's made from silk, linen and fur and it's on display at the Met in New York. Here's a slightly later tunic from Palermo, Italy. It's dated between 1125 and 1150. So this tunic was made from silk and was richly decorated with gold and pearls around the circumference of the neck, bottom hem and the sleeves. So as you can see in the diagram on the right, the long sleeves were quite wide at the shoulder, yet fitted closely to the forearms and especially the wrists. And like the Norse and Saxon tunics, gores have been added at the side for additional fullness in the skirt. So here's a close-up of the dolman sleeve on Krasnus's tunic, and it's joined to the body of the tunic with this right angle seam. This sleeve is cut overly long and then it's ruched up, were gathered into a rather tapered forearm. And some of the additional volume has been tacked with a few stitches, as you can see here. And the fabric looks like a sand silk, like we see in many of the Dorn costumes. And they've also applied a series of running stitches on the front panel, you know, for added texture. But I also suspect that the fabric is lined with another fabric to give it a bit of a quilted look. 
I shamelessly stole this image to show you a beautiful example of a running stitch used on a reproduction of a Viking caftan. So the stitches are used both to reinforce the seams at stress points, but also to be decorative. So this is taken from Kenna's closet. She's an active member of the Society for Creative Anachronism in the Kingdom of Glien Abden. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. The wrapping of these colorful fabrics, it's what looks like African wax print fabric might be influenced by the Egyptians, although the Greeks and the Romans also wrapped in knotted fabric about their bodies as well. So in Essos, the slaves of Volantis used this same technique, although with rough cottons and linens rather than fine silks. The good masters wear these brass or perhaps bronze rings stamped with these glyph style symbols with the colorful silks holding them in position with a series of knots and ties. The zigzag motif looks like the Egyptian symbol of water, and I have assumed that there is some significance to the placement of the knots and the size and number of the rings, perhaps indicating their status. As a frame of reference, here's an example of how an Egyptian garment might have been wrapped and knotted about the body. Here are some examples of African super wax print fabric that I found from Kintage Textiles. To produce wax printed cloth, a wax resin is applied to the fabric before it is submerged into the dye in order to allow the dye to repel the wax covered parts of the fabric. This process is repeated to build up a colored design on the fabric. Multiple wooden stamp blocks would be needed for each color within the design. And then the cloth is then boiled to remove the wax and is usually reused. Here is a close-up of one of Krasnus's brooches that keep his cape in place. Here's a side back look at the cape. The green silk cape is made of a series of panels that are seamed together. It's lined and then bound with a yellow silk border. The Giscari Harpy that makes up Krasnus' scepter is the heraldic emblem of the cities of Slaver's Bay and derived from ancient Greek mythology. A harpy is similar to a siren, which is a bird-like creature with a human head. In mythology, harpies are said to torment humans by stealing their food and screeching so terribly the humans cannot eat or rest. The Egyptian equivalent to the good master's scepter might be the was scepter, was meaning power or dominion, and the sekum scepter, which is symbolic of authority, or the abba scepter meaning is that which commands. Both symbols are Egyptian hieroglyphs, like the harpy scourge that Krasnus holds. In Egyptian culture, the scepter or staff is one of the most ancient symbols of authority. Here's a close-up of the scourge with a leather cat of nine tails whip with bronze claws at the end. In Egyptian culture, the flail, as it was called, would not necessarily have been used as an instrument of torture. Seen here on a coffin out of Tutankhamun, the flail actually represented fertility of the land and was used to thresh grain. Like the waz and sekum symbols, the flail is also an Egyptian hieroglyph. This picture cracks me up because while the actor that played Krasnus caught a bit of sun, it looks like, it appears that his pale white feet have never seen the light of day. So it's important to be consistent with makeup. The feet sometimes need a bit of a sunny glow. And his Persian style leather shoes are similar to the pointy style ones that are worn by Varus when he's in Pentos. One of the most striking costumes that we saw in season three is Masande's slave costume. And I'm sure some jaws dropped at the first sight of her. Compared to the other slaves, Masande is actually very well dressed. It's not as elaborate as the slave masters, obviously, but despite her slave collar, she is dressed very finely. Her outfit is silk in the same hues as her master's, and from what I can tell, it's one length of wide silk that at the halfway point is pleated and woven through the slave collar, and then it's tacked down with running stitches, just like we see on the front of Krasnus's tunic. 
The remaining portion is then drawn between her legs, creating a skirt of sorts, and then it's wrapped around the front where it is tapered and wrapped around the ring on the lower portion of her tummy. By the placement and draping of the costume, which cuts well below her navel, the costume covers all of the important bits while leaving these strategic peekaboo openings. It fits her so exactly, in fact, that it looks like the cutter draped the costume right on actor Nathaniel Emanuel before sewing it all together. And if you watch the scenes where Miss Sandy is walking with what looks like some discomfort, you will see that she has very little side leg coverage. And there's a little bit of grime where the silk cloth attaches to the collar, showing that it's likely her only item of clothing. And strangely, it doesn't look like this dress can detach from the collar in any way, which is sort of weird, since my understanding is that the slaves can never remove their collars. So I don't think that us, the audience, is really expected to have put that much thought into it. But if you look closely, you can also see that an additional panel of fabric has been added around the back to add a bit, but not much more, coverage. And once Danny acquires Miss Sande, her clothes provide more coverage and in the same style as the other Astapor female house slaves. Here's an example of this type of gown seen on the slave behind Danny. Miss Sande dons a linen tunic and cape in reverse color of Danny's. While the blues in Danny's costume are meant as a tribute to Khal Drogo, derived from a precious mineral of the Dothraki people, the blue in Miss Sande's dress is closer to the muted blues we see on the slave masters of Astapor. The choker that Miss Sande wears is a direct match to Danny's, as Michelle Clapton has pointed out, is a dedication to the long-suffering slaves. In this shot, Miss Sandy wears a simple fibula brooch that fastens her cloak in place. In this image, we also get a good look at her altered hairstyle. According to a 2014 interview with Michelle Clapton by Fast Company, they stated that the uniform of the Unsullied, an army of elite warrior eunuchs, was inspired by beetles and can fit many different body types, but not at the expense of a metaphor. Clapton said the final piece that really made it come together was the idea of obscuring the face. This really removed all personality. It sort of felt that it was the perfect ethos to be unsullied, all personality removed. Michelle Clapton said, Sometimes what looks to be the simplest costume is often the most difficult, especially when they must fit many people. The Unsullied costume was difficult only in that it had to create a uniform shape that could give almost any shaped man a look of strength, and yet it had to be light and not cover too much of the body. We filmed in Morocco where extras were narrow-shouldered and then filmed in Croatia where men were huge, Clapton said. On set, the helmets immediately unified the group as a true army. Clapton recalled there were all sorts of issues when we were filming because they started behaving as a pack. The crew ended up creating a new rule. You can't put your helmet on until you get to set. The Anseli background player on the left and the guard on his right are wearing trousers that look like a version of harem pants, called dhoti in some cultures in Southeast Asia. Dhoti originates from the Sanskrit word dauta, meaning washed or clean. Essentially, the pants are made from one length of unsewn cloth that are wrapped around the legs and tucked into the front. It's possible that these are just mock versions of these pants to save on time dressing a large number of background players. What doesn't appear to be mocked are these leg wraps on the calves. They are long strips of cloth wrapped in a crisscross fashion down to the ankles. The unsullied armor is an odd choice in my opinion. So the gorget, shoulders, and cuirass portions, they look like they're boiled leather or queer bully, and I've talked about that in previous videos. And while I'm not an armor expert by any means, the cuirass appears to have an absence of a breastplate, which is the most important segment of armor, in my humble opinion, since it's, it's what protects your chest. And I'm not quite even sure what this panel is here. Maybe it's intended to be ventilation of some kind. 
And then Danny Missandei later emulated the shape of the Unsullied armor, you know, well into season seven even, for which Michelle Clapton stated was inspired by the hood of a cobra. The spears and shields used by the Unsullied are similar to the hoplites or heavy infantry in ancient Greece. The spear is called a dory. It's an ancient weapon made of wood with a flat leaf shaped spearhead composed of iron and its weight was counterbalanced by a bronze butt spike. The Greek dory was capped with a butt spike, which was called a lizard killer, that would be used as a second weapon if the spearhead broke off. We see round shields used by a variety of cultures throughout history, but keeping with the Greek hoplites, their shields were called an aspis or hoplon. The aspis was a convex shaped deeply dished heavy wooden shield. Here are a few vase paintings depicting the aspis. On the left is a detail of hoplites go to battle at the sounds of music from the 7th century BC, and on the right an attic black figure neck amphora circa 550 BC from Volci. Here's a shield very similar to the Unsullied, although it is much smaller. This shield or Indian doll is from the 19th century and it's made from hide, silver, iron and lacquer. And the round raised portion in the middle, like we see on the Unsullied shield, is called a boss or umbo. The boss was originally designed to deflect blows from the center of round shields. Here's an example of a highly corroded iron shield boss from the 1st to 5th century AD, believed to be for a Roman or Celtic shield. Here's a picture of a reproduction Viking shield with a shield boss. This comes from a video by creator Shadowversity called The Truth About a Shield Boss. He hypothesizes that the real reason for the boss is weight distribution. So I'll leave that video in the description if you want to check it out. It's actually really fascinating. According to Michelle Clapton, the Unsullied costumes were the hardest to make. They were very specific in the book about having a spike on top of the helmet, but it just looked too German First World War, so we had to change it. With a book, people have built up an image of how they think characters should look, and then I come along and don't make it like it is in their heads. And she adds, bending the points on the helmet creates a more elegant look. I suspect that Clapton is referring to this particular Kaiser helmet that she thinks would look too World War II. The pickle helm, or pickle helm, was a spiked helmet worn in the 19th and 20th centuries by German military, firefighters, and police. And on the left is a Bavarian military pickle helm, and on the right is Kaiser Wilhelm II, August van Mackersen, and others wearing pickle halben with cloth covers in 1915. After a bit of research, and I can certainly explore this more, I believe that the description of the helmet of the book would look more like this Turkish helmet that's seen on the left on exhibit from the Met in New York City. So this helmet dates between the 15th and 16th century. It has a similar nasal guard to the Unsullied, although not nearly as long. And this helmet would have had chainmail as added protection. The Christian states adopted this style of helmet in the late 17th century. And the Sally helmet on the right is from the late 15th to early 16th century, and it has a closer shape to the dome portion of the helmet. This helmet is Spanish, possibly Grenada, and is made from steel, gold, silver, and enamel. This steel lobster tail burgonet is getting even closer to the silhouette of the Unsullied with the exception of the visor. The rest, however, is very close. It has the ear flaps, nose guard, and a neck guard created by a series of riveted plates that create the lobster tail feature. This Northern European helmet from the Met in New York probably dates in the second quarter of the 17th century. This style of helmet was an adaptation of the Turkish style helmets from the 16th century. The visor of the Unsullied is similar to the helmet that's shaped in the form of a cloth turban. This 17th century iron and copper alloy helmet is Indian, probably by Jaipur. Sorry that this is not the best picture. 
but the helmet also closely resembles the Polish Hussar helmet seen on display at the Uniform Arms and Uniforms at the National Museum in Krakow, Poland. And in this picture, you'll see that the unsullied helmet neck guard doesn't flare out quite as much as the lobster tail burgonet. It just has a gentle sweep of three plates. And finally, in this close-up at the front of the helm, we see how the visor is attached. And I'm not sure if it's practical, but the visor is meant to be retractable. And that does it for this episode two of the Costumes of Essos. If you missed any of the other episodes in the Essos series, I will leave a link in the description below so that you can catch up. And if you like what you see, please like and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss a thing. And if you want to see more Game of Thrones dedicated videos, consider supporting me through Patreon. Happy holidays, and as always, thank you so much for watching.